that working? Excellent. All right. So I'm here to talk about pottery, which I came to rather unexpectedly. When I was living in Washington, DC, I had a housemate who was taking pottery classes. And she kept bringing home all these beautiful things. And I wanted to do that too. So at the end of 2011 is when I took my first pottery class. And the next year, when I was getting ready to move back to Oregon, I surprised myself by starting to tell people that if I could do anything, I would be a potter. Um, and that's when I was still making mugs that weighed a pound and <laughs> were this size. So it seemed kind of crazy. Um, but here I am, and I am doing pottery, and I really enjoy it. And I've learned quite a bit in the last few years, and that's what I'm here to tell you about. So I work with porcelain mostly. It, um, it's really nice to throw and work with, and it, the one that I work with is quite translucent. I don't know if you can see that from back there, but the light gets through it. Um, but it starts with just a bag of clay that I buy from a clay supplier. Um, and the first step is to take off a chunk of it. And when you buy it from the clay supplier, it's been sitting in this bag for quite a while, and um, find their most stable place. And um, in order to get it easy to work with, you need to get it in motion again. So you wedge it to um, average out all of what those particles have been doing and so that they'll be happy to move in any direction you want them to move. And you also want to get any bubbles out of the clay because um, that'll just cause problems down the line. And you want to make sure that it's nice and evenly mixed. And then if you want to make things that are pretty similar in size, it really helps to weigh it out. And then you make it into a ball and they stack really nicely. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I use a wheel for all of my work. Um, so this is, this is my wheel, and it's not usually this clean. Um, but basically all it is is it's a metal disc that rotates nice and smoothly, and you control the speed with, um, with a foot pedal. Um, and you may wonder, why is it called throwing? Um, when you're using a turning wheel, well, it turns out that potters have been using this word to describe what they're doing since the word throw meant to turn. Um, and so potters have continued to use the word that way, even though the rest of society has changed the way that they think of that word. So um, it's just a much older way of thinking about it. So the thing that makes um, clay clay is a mineral called kaolin, and it exists naturally as these hexagonal plates. Um, and so this is a scanning electron micrograph that I found online of, um, or actually in a, in a paper online, of showing what they look like. So the um, scale bar here is two microns. So they're quite small, but they really are just these individual sheets. And so the crystal structure of these, um, it's just in one dimension. Um, there's the, the repeat unit is just a single um, layer. And so they'll stack on top of each other and water molecules can get in between those two layers, and that's what allows them to slide um, relative to each other and gives it that smooth movement that you use when you're throwing clay. Um, and it turns out that the smaller these kaolin particles, they can break up into smaller pieces as well, and the smaller sizes are the ones that make the clay more plastic, more easily to bend and to, and to form. Um, so that's what's going on inside of this ball of clay that is on top of my wheel. Um, and I made a video yesterday of me throwing to give you an idea, uh, so you can see what the process looks like. And um, sometimes I'm faster at throwing than I am in this video, but um, my, the second one that I was doing that was trying to be more streamlined, uh, my phone ran out of memory, so this is the one we're stuck with. Um, and, um, so, it, it, so you center the clay. You want to make sure that it's, it's evenly distributed around that, that still point at the turning wheel. And then you can start to shape it. Um, and so you're using your hands on the inside and outside of the pot to pull the clay up. Um, and one of the books that I found really helpful as I was learning how to, to throw pots was Pottery on the Wheel um, by Elspeth Woody. Because um, I really loved her descriptions about the process of, of throwing. Because when you first start out, um, that ball of clay that's moving on the wheel has lots of bumps on it. And so your hands are moving in response to that. But really what needs to happen 
is your hands need to be the ones that are the, what's in control and not the clay. And so um, I'll just read a couple of quotes while, while the video is running so you don't get bored. Um, so let's see. So the, uh, let's see. Remember that the clay is an inert mass with no will of its own and is soft and pliable. The potter has the will, the power, and the determination to control the few pounds of clay. Um, and, anyways, the other quote is similar lines, but it's, it's basically that um, you have to be ready to throw the clay when you sit down at the potter wheel because your hands have to be really steady. And what I find is that it, it ends up being a very meditative experience because as soon as you lose your focus, your hands slip and you've ruined your pot, especially if you're doing the more delicate work and really pulling the walls quite thin. Um, so that's me throwing. And so I'm, what I'm throwing there is this shape. Um, I'll let it run for just a tiny bit longer. There it is. So once you've got it made, um, so if you notice that I had that uh, brown plastic um, disc on top of the wheel, it's called a bat, and they come in other shapes as well. And what that lets you do is you lets you lift off a delicate piece um, so that you don't have to touch it directly when it's still wet and um, will lose its shape. And so you let it sit until um, it's dry enough that you can touch it without sticking to it, and you can start to tell just from the way that it looks, it, it loses its shininess and it becomes a little bit dull. And then you can cut it off and turn it upside down. And then you trim away the excess on the bottom. And I cut one apart. Um, so you can see what it is that you're doing in the trimming process. You're giving it a, what's called a foot. And so giving it a little um, indentation in the bottom so that if you put hot liquids in it, it's not gonna burn the table. And also it means that you can glaze that underside. Um, and then I put my logo, which is a bicycle, on the bottom. And I don't really work this fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, you can also attach handles when it's in that stage after you've trimmed it, um, which I'm not going to show. But um, these are a few that have handles on them. And then they just sit on the shelf to dry and lose all of that water that allowed you to, to do the throwing. And at this stage, if you've made a mistake or if one gets a crack in it, it, you can put it in water and it'll just slake back into clay and you can use it again. Um, but what makes it a ceramic is going through a firing process. So you're going from the greenware, which is what it's called when you haven't fired it, um, to the first firing, which is a bisque, and then to the glaze firing, um, the final one. So to understand what happens in those different firings, it's helpful to know what it is that the clay is made out of. So there's actually three different things that are um, in porcelain. So one is kaolin, it's um, those um, hexagons that we saw before. Um, and then uh, there's also quartz, which is the top photo. And you can see those little shards. That's the reason, the <laughs> kind of the physical shape of those is why um, potters are, um, we really should be very careful about breathing in the clay dust because those little shards get in your lungs and they're on the right size to um, cause some good damage. So they can get all the way into the, the tiny parts of your lungs. So don't, don't breathe quartz dust. Um, and then the other one is feldspar. And so the, um, the kaolin is what gives it the clay-like characteristics and then the quartz are aggregates that help give it some structure. And then the feldspar is what helps it all melt together. So um, here's a diagram showing that depending on what kind of porcelain you want to make, there's lots of different um, qualities that a porcelain might have. You can vary what these different components are and also the particular characteristics of, of each of these. So for me, the firing process happens in this little kiln. Um, and it's an electric kiln. And um, uh, 
So you start out in a kiln at room temperature. You put the things in cold, and then you're slowly heating it up. And so it's a little bit like an oven in terms that you're using heat to trans do a chemical transformation. But unlike baking a potato, you're not setting the oven at a certain temperature and then getting to put your um, work in when it gets to the right temperature. So we're going to be gradually heating it up, and it's going to be absorbing energy over that whole time. So we need a way of measuring how much heat it's absorbed in order to do those chemical transformations. And so that's what we use pyrometric cones for. So it's measuring what the fire has done. Um, and so what these are is they're um, materials that have been engineered so that they will melt and start to bend when they've absorbed a certain amount of heat work. And so that lets you tell how far into the process you've gone. It's, you can't really stick a fork in a baked potato. It, you could stick a fork in a baked potato, but you can't do anything like that to your ceramics that are in your kiln. So that's what the cones are for, to have a visual representation of how, how far things have progressed. Um, and so there's no way you can read this, but this is the cone chart that comes from the company that makes them. And they go all the way from the lowest temperature ones. They bend at the lowest temperature. It's 022 and then they go all the way up to cone 14. So the range that I use um, is from cone 05 um, to cone 6, or that's what I've shown here. So the O basically just means a negative. So those are the lower ones. So it goes 04, 05, 04, 03, 02, 01, and then 1, 2, 3. And it's a little bit confusing, but if you get it wrong, you really get it wrong. So um, yeah. So, oh, and here's the other thing. So as I mentioned, it's a measure of how much heat is, has, the piece has absorbed. And so what that means is that there's not a particular temperature that it melts at. What temperature it actually starts to bend at depends on how quickly you've been heating it as you're approaching that um, maturation point. So for Kono 5, if you're heating it slowly at just 27 degrees Fahrenheit increase per hour, it's going to bend at 1,870 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you're cranking at 270 degrees Fahrenheit per hour, you're going to have to go all the way up to 1,900 um, degrees in order to get that to melt. So um, the other thing that's happening is, so here's this that information presented in a way that's going to be easier to show you what's going on inside the firing process. Um, and then the color here is to indicate that um, your pieces really are glowing. So this, I took this picture this morning in my bisque firing. Um, and that is the top people looking into the kiln. And that glow is coming from the work that's in there. So you start out, you stick the dry uh, greenware into the kiln. And the first thing you do is to just slowly raise the temperature to just below the boiling point of water. Um, and that's because if you have any water still in there and there's enough of it all together, the water's going to boil and that can break apart your piece. Um, but you can avoid that by letting it sit below the boiling temperature, drive all that water off first, and then you're, you're good to go. The next thing that happens um, is that kaolin, the, the thing that makes it clay, undergoes a chemical transformation into a metakaolin is what it's called. And in that process, some more water is lost, but that water was part of the molecular structure of the kaolin. And I found a paper that talked about this. And um, so that's that structure again of kaolin from before. And then um, the larger figure, this, this is an x-ray diffraction. Um, spectrum and and what it's showing is that there in this sample there's a repeating structure and so it, it's because it's a crystal we get these peaks um, and they're characteristic of kaolin but once you've gone through that um, transformation into meta kaolin the um, electron microscope image shows that there's some difference in the way that it looks but the um, x-ray diffraction data really shows that it's lost all of that repeating um, structure in there. And I found another paper that sh did a molecular dynamic simulation of how the atoms in this crystal might move in order to do this transformation process. So that, that first one up there that's all nice and orderly, that's kaolin. And then they did a simulation um, just on how atoms 
um, are likely to behave as you increase the temperature and as they move around and jostle around and end up with this really disordered structure. And that's that last one there. And, it, and when they did an analysis of their simulation and compared to experimental results, they matched nicely. So this is a reasonable way of, of imagining how it's happening. Um, so the next thing that happens is you keep heating up your um, greenware in the kiln, which is not greenware anymore, is those quartz particles are going to go in inversion. They're going to change what, um, the way that, that um, atoms are rearranged. And that happens at 573 degrees Celsius. Um, so I found an animated GIF for this. Um, so the alpha form is the one that happens at lower temperatures. And as you increase the temperatures, there's more motion in the atoms. And so it's a larger form that's more spread out, is more favorable. And so that's the beta form. And so when you go through that point, it's going to occupy a larger volume. And so you want to be careful as you're heating up your wear that it's not, it doesn't go through that too quickly so that it can evenly go through this translation instead of just the outside's already in the beta form and the inside's still in the alpha form. All right, so if you keep going up, um, you'll burn out uh, any organic material that's in there. So if there were bacteria and mold growing in your clay when you pulled it out of the bag, that all burns out in the kiln, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then you keep going further, and that's when sintering begins. So I didn't find a good image for this, but what sintering is, is that the edges of your particles, your silica and your feldspar and your metacalin, start to melt together. And so they become physically attached to each other. And so this is what makes then the bisque um, ware stronger than just your green wear. And if you were to keep going further, you end up um, adding a new structure to the mix, and that's molite. And these are these needle-like crystals that form out of the, um, the kaolin particles. But we don't want that to happen in that first firing. And so we stop before we get to that point. And so somewhere in the Kono 6, Kono 4 range is what we use for bisque firing. All right, so you unload the kiln once it's cooled down and you're ready to um, put some glaze on. So I'm showing these again. So what we want to end up with is this nice glassy surface um, on your piece. And you'll notice that the clay body is also going to change um, as we do that next firing as well. But talking about just this glassy surface, um, there's three components that allow you to get there. Um, so one of them needs to be something that actually is that glass. And then you also need alumina, which gets it to stick to the clay, and then a flux to get those two different things to melt enough that they become this new um, uh, st structure on the, on the top. And so you'll choose the formula for this based on when the clay is going to mature, so what temperature this reaches its um, appropriate characteristics. So you want it, um, the flux to work so that they, they match up. And a lot of times you'll want to have some other properties of the glaze as well. You can use an opacifier to make it um, so that light can't get through it and so you can get a nice bright white or um, you often want color, although I, li I like a nice clear glaze. And so the, the colorants are mostly in that first row in the D block. Um, and so it's actually because those D electrons um, in a, in a crystal field, the energies will split, and then the electronic transitions absorb light in the visible range. So that's why those are the colorants. So I couldn't find a good slide for crystal field theory, but you can look that up if you're interested. Um, but anyways, I ended up finding a glaze recipe that worked really well without having to do a lot of fiddling. And so similar to the, the porcelain, you can get minerals that will give you those components that you want. Um, and it's, it's an insoluble powder that you just suspend in water and then you can dip your piece in it and, and you'll coat the surface. And then you want to make sure that you clean the bottoms off because the glaze is going to completely melt in the firing and it becomes essentially a glue. So it's going to permanently attach whatever is stuck to it. So if you've got a handle, having glaze on the handle helps it 
stay connected, but you really don't want it to stay connected to your kiln shelf. So then you put it back in the kiln and you go through the firing process again. Um, it will again through the, go through the quartz inversion because we still have quartz um, in the clay body. Um, any organic material will again get burned out and sintering happens um, in the glaze this time. And uh, the glaze materials often come with some other components in them. And so those are gonna burn off um, kind of within that bisque range as well. And so now molite is going to form, those needles are gonna form and we want them to happen. Um, and so this is a, uh, another scanning electron um, image showing those long molite crystals that are in um, a chunk that was a feldspar particle. And so those darker pieces are silica. And so those are still there as <coughs> aggregates within, um, within the porcelain. And I found some other cool images for different forms of molite that can form in the different, depending on where, um, what things it was coming from in that firing process. So once the firing is complete, you cool it down and then you can unload your pieces. And so you can see that nice shiny surface uh, where the glaze was and where there wasn't glaze, it's still matte. And that's it. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right, Isaiah. My question was, after the first firing where all the particles fused together, would that mean that, that essentially the bisque, the after the bisque firing, the entire, ceramic, the, the entire ceramic piece is one particle? All right, so it is. <laughs> it's even more when you glaze fire it, but yeah. Okay, next question. <laughs> yes. I have a piece of greenware that's about three years old. Is there a time limit to when you can shape it and then get it into the kiln? As long as you haven't broken it, <laughs> you're great. I mean, that's, that's the biggest, so I, this one already has a crack. It's really easy to break anywhere. <laughs> so that's that's the biggest hazard. Yeah. But um but there's there's no reason for the silica or the feldspar or for the um kale and to, to degrade in any sort of way sitting on the shelf. All right, next question. Yeah. Once and the first to get that sound and he was listening before he gave me, you know, any feedback about my work. Tell me more about that sound. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um so it's often used in finished pieces. Uh, so if it rings at just a single tone, what that's indicating is that um, there's one thing that's vibrating. Um, and so not all glazes fit the clay body well. And so what can happen is if your glaze has lots of small cracks in it, um, it's not gonna ring in that way. And so that's often what you're listening for. Um, for that. <laughs> I don't know if this one rings all that well, but yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> yes? So you had a graph earlier that showed the kaolin particles going from order to disorder mm -hmm. after, as it's heating up. Yeah. Well, typically, if you think about like water going from liquid to solid, it's going from disorder to order to become more structured. But in this case, it goes from order to disorder to become more Am I interpreting that correctly? Okay, well, let, me, let me go back to that slide. So, I'm sure if I'm asking um, well, as you increase temperature, disorder does increase. So things get less ordered with increasing temperature. That's pretty typical. So is it this one? Yes, this one. Yeah. Um, so it seemed like the Kaolin was causing, because it was able to like slide and move around using that elasticity, and when you bake it, it creates structure. That seems backwards in my mind to what I'm seeing here, which is structure going to disorder. Uh, and maybe I'm just thinking about it the wrong way. Uh, quite likely. I think you're thinking about it in a different sort of way. Mm -hmm. So um, it, when you're throwing, the ability f for them to slide across each other um, 
that's not necessarily directly related to entropy. Um, but here, yeah. Um, I don't. Alright. Yes. So, is it just a glaze that becomes a single crystal, or? Well, so it's not. It's not really a crystal. Um, but it's all of the, um, the atoms are connected to each other. Is it so, solid like glass? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what, uh, like, why, why does it need to go through two fire? Because I still have not quite grasp that. So sometimes people will fire everything at once and you'll put, um, so if I'm not going to glaze it at all, I'll often just fire it once and let it go all the way up to the glaze temperature. Um, and that works fine. But it can be a problem if you put the glaze on when the piece is wet. The first thing is that to dip this dry clay into a wet glaze, um, delicate pieces don't always survive that. And the other thing is that the, um, in the bisque firing, there's quite a few gases that often um, come out of the clay. And if the glaze is already on there, sometimes they get trapped in the glaze and you can have Pocket. strange behavior. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just wondering it's kind of a pocket between the glaze and the head. <coughs> yeah, it can. Um, so I, I tried um, just recently what would happen if I once fired it with some glaze on it and it ended up with these weird bubbly structures. So it was just worth it to, to do two separate firings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was there, like, has the glaze and the bisque fire, has that always been kind of connected? Like, like, or do, was there a time when, you know, I don't know, 2,000 years ago when people were trying to figure out how to throw pots and make them and fire them, was there a time where one happened, like this fire happened and that was that, and then they didn't have it figured out, or was there any overlap? Well, um, certainly earthenware is um, fired to the lower temperatures within the bisque range, and there are, um, you can have functional earthenware that doesn't have glaze on it, and usually they'll have nice burnished surfaces. Um, and so that, it's, it's only gotten to um, that bisque phase, and so you, different materials are gonna center at different temperatures, so those are ones where, even if you're firing it to maturity at these much lower temperatures, the elements in there are starting to fuse even at that lower temperature, so you have a, that um, property going on. But like the um, old pots that were fired just in an open wood fire, those are at that within that temperature range. Um, but and so I, I believe it takes like a, an enclosed kiln in order to get to those much higher temperatures. Yeah, and probably the, I, I don't know enough about how um, way way back when China had those original porcelains, if they were doing separate firings um, for the first stage and for the second stage as well. It may be that they were once firing their work, which would make a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah. I noticed uh, the examples you have there, the sizes decrease through each of the stages. Yes. Is that something to plan for due to the heat making the molecular bond? Yes. Okay. Um, if you've ever had friends who have taken pottery <coughs> classes and they give you tiny mugs, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Um, because this looks like a nice sized cup, doesn't it? Well, this is how big it's going to be by the time it's finished. And so part of it, so it, it is that the atoms are all becoming more condensed as it's going through these chemical transformations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read on the website that you did like a pretty high level studying of chemistry before and had that <laughs> other life path almost. Did. So I was kind of curious about how it was for you, the transition to the creative practice that you've established and if, yeah, how that went for you. <laughs> so I've, I've always really loved the creative side as well and making things and, um, and drawing and I didn't, I always make a lot of time for that when I was studying. I, I did get a PhD in chemistry, um, so I went all the way. <laughs> um, but um, it actually, it, it was a surprising process. I, when I moved back from DC, I 
thought that I needed to get a real job, and so I spent six months looking for one and, and wasn't getting anywhere with that. It felt like the longer I was looking, the less clear I was about what I was looking for. So um, that's when I decided to go ahead and give pottery a try. So it was, it's definitely been a disorienting sort of a process, but I feel like it's been a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. Was that transition you said from saying, if I could do anything that would like to be a potter to actually like, pursuing it, was it like, all of a sudden, or was it gradual? And oh, very gradual. To realize. I still feel like it's crazy, kind of. Because, yeah. um, so, um, I had only, let's see, I'd been taking classes, not very seriously even, um, for maybe like a year and a half when I decided to stop looking for work and just spend six months doing pottery. And I wasn't very good. <laughs> Um, but I, I started trying to sell it and then have been gradually getting better at it. So I think if, if I had done it intentionally, I would have waited until I was actually good at it to try to sell stuff. But I, that's, that's, that's what has happened. Yeah. Yeah. And so a year ago, I did a Kickstarter just about a year ago and got a, a wheel and a kiln um, to go get my new studio space. So um, that's, that's where I am in the process. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you go. Uh, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit just uh, about the forms that you're yeah. sort of working with and how, how you found them. And, I mean, it seems like you have a consistent mm -hmm. set of forms that you're working with. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, how you arrived at them. Um, I, I haven't. Um, it's, it's more like these are the shapes that I find myself always making. And, and I enjoy drinking out of things that have a little bit of a curve to the lip um, and then kind of a rounded um, uh, base just feels comfortable in the hand. So I, I think it's more just like the things that I enjoy holding and the shapes that I enjoy holding are that process. I know other potters do a lot of drawing and like plan things out that way. My process is much more like, okay, these are the, the shapes that I keep finding myself making. Can you talk about the process, um, uh, how you apply like, the artwork to or the, the more graphic pieces to the... Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I should have done a slide for that. Um, but, um, okay. Oh, that's fine. Um, but I, I can... Uh, so, on a number of my pieces, I have crows on them. And so those are from videos that I've taken. I've taken those images. And, and so I actually have a rubber stamp that I use and then just use regular ink um, to stamp it on the clay. And then I paint over that. And so that's what allows me to have a fairly um, regular um, shapes. I can't draw crows freehand. <laughs> um, so, so this I would paint over with an underglaze before I do that first firing. Um, so it's all just with a small paintbrush and black underglaze is how I do those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So ceramics are mugs and dishes that kind of have a matte finish. Are those? Is that like a? Is that? Are those still glazed or are those still considered uh, greenware? They're definitely glazed. Um, so a greenware, if you put it in water, it's just gonna go back into clay. Oh, okay. Um, so it's definitely not that. Um, but the glazes, um, this is just kind of the basic um, components of a glaze. And the glass itself is amorphous. It doesn't have any sort of a crystal structure. But you can put additional elements in there that are much more likely to form crystals. And so very small crystals are what give you that matte surface. And so even though the glaze has reached maturity and it did melt, as the glaze then cooled, you got crystals to form. And then that scatters the light and gives you that matte surface. Yeah? If you wanted to turn this greenware back into clay that could be used, how do you gauge how much water you're adding back to it? Is it just by a touch? Well, um, you just drop it in your slot bucket. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with all of the little bits of trimmings that you've from your wheel, um, and you let it slake down, and, and there's a layer of water that will 
form on the surface is it all just kind of settles and then you kind of sponge that off and then um, you just dry you I run my clay through a sieve once it's slaked down for a while to just break up any of the small chunks and then scoop it out onto a drying board and then the water evaporates so it's not measured at all <laughs> yeah and, uh, and then you don't reclaim on this scale either you just throw it all together and um, there's usually a lot that you, needs to be reclaimed. Yeah. yeah. I know you mentioned the book, The Pottery on the Wheel. Were yeah. there any other educational resources that you were referencing when you were first starting to learn or apprenticeships that you pursued or did you just self-teach? Um, I, there were a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> um, Simon Leach has a bunch of YouTube videos. I watched a bunch of his. Um, there's another book, throwing book, that I didn't bring with me, um, but I'm happy to give you the information if you're interested, that I, that I also found really helpful. I basically checked out all of the books that the library had <laughs> on pottery and then found a few that I really liked and bought those. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you planning to write a book yourself? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not about pottery. <laughs> <laughs> What about teaching? Would you enjoy teaching? Okay. I have enjoyed teaching, yes. I, when I went to graduate school, I thought I was going to be a chemistry professor. Um, but you always have to have a lab if you're going to be a chemistry professor. And also, I uh, wanted to do something more related to sustainability. So that's, oh, teaching pottery. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> 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 I don't have a, a place particularly to do that, but I, I love teaching and I would be happy to teach pottery too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? You said you weren't going to write a book on pottery. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> There's a lot of excellent books on pottery, so I feel like that's a, it's, it's been done. Yeah. Yeah. I know, Amanda, that you do yes. some custom work you might mention of your other art, you do sketching and that sort of I, thing? I, I still love drawing and I, I, on some of the, the pieces that I brought, if, if you want to see what they feel like, uh, I have flowers that I've drawn as well on those as, in, in addition to the birds. Um, and when I did my Kickstarter, one of the rewards was a custom mug with an equation or a phrase of your choice. And because I do have a lot of science friends, it was fun. I got a, a couple of people that picked um, complicated molecules that they'd solve the structures of. Or, and one was like a protein that they, a membrane protein that she'd solve the structure of. That was a lot of work. <laughs> 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 All right. Any other questions? Yes. With your education, you have a unique perspective on all of this. Not, I would think not many potters would have that background in chemistry to understand what's happening. How do you learn that to be able to come to the point of being able to make beautiful products, knowing what colors and all of that? Does that just come out of learning from books? Well, um, I use the glaze that doesn't have any color in it. Um, but uh, so how did I learn what I know about pottery? Or, so, but pottery itself is, is a practice that, that doesn't require all of the technical knowledge. For all of the practical side, you don't need to understand very much. It becomes helpful for certain things when you run into problems to be able to fix them, but um, it's kind of like baking. You can understand this is the reaction that happens when you brown butter, but you don't need to know what that reaction is in order to cook a delicious meal. So, um, yeah. I, I learned the science stuff on here last weekend, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I maybe procrastinated a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, any other questions? Yes? Um, what, why is it called this? Ah, I didn't look that one up again, sorry. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, yes? S sort of harp on the science thing. What kind uh -huh. of chemist were you? What? What kind of chemist were you? I uh, was in the physical chemistry division, 
But I, oh, I took that slide out. <laughs> um, I, I was actually um, in the chemical biology program at Berkeley, and I, my project was on gene regulation in a bacteria, or sorry, a virus that infects uh, E. coli, which is a bacterium that lives in your gut. It's a model system. So, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I think that's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you. from the Oregon Employment Department with his talk, Portland by the Numbers, three questions we're afraid to ask about the Portland economy. We know that Portland's a special place, but what is it exactly that makes Portland special? How does Portland measure up to other American cities? Together, we'll look at the strengths, weaknesses, and unintended side effects of Portland's <coughs> booming economy in 2016. And let's have another round of applause from that other.